Hello, this is Brett from Survival Comms. So today on the bench, we have a Kenwood EF Johnson VM8000 mobile radio. Now, this radio is a multi-band, multi-protocol, two-way radio. The bands are VHF, UHF, in 7 and 800 megahertz. The protocols supported are P25 Phase 1 and 2 trunking, P25 conventional, DMR Tier 2 and 3, Analog FM, and Viking 16, which is a legacy SmartNet, SmartZone compatible protocol. Now, this radio only does 50 watts VHF, 45 watts UHF, 30 watts 700, and 35 watts on 800. So we'll take a look around the body of the radio and reconfigure the physical package of the radio for my purposes. First impression, the physical package of this radio is enormous, and it's longer than my high-power Apex 8500, but it's less thick. This radio uses a monolithic aluminum chassis with two stamped steel covers on top and bottom retained by machine screws. The length of the radio would make it difficult to fit into a modern console as this configuration, the chassis length itself, is 11 inches long. The as-supplied control head features a small forward firing speaker. The audio power amplifier of this radio is capable of 15 watts of audio, so we're definitely going to be remoting a larger speaker. The mic port is an RJ45, and it's reinforced around its perimeter. The 12 programmable buttons are of the rubber membrane variety, and the display is of a sufficient size, in my opinion. The rear of the radio features two leads. One is for radio power, and the other is a 9-pin Molex connector for speaker and power amplifier audio, ignition sense, horn ring, and ground. We have an in-female connector for RF, an SMA female for GPS, and a reverse polarity SMA for Wi-Fi. And just underneath that, we have a DB25 female for accessory connections as well. Under these two covers, we have a USB-C, which is our programming port, and a 3.5 millimeter audio jack. Now, one thing of note is that this radio uses balanced audio, so when connecting this radio to test equipment, ensure you're using an isolation transformer. The first change we're going to make to the radio is to remove the supplied control head you just saw and install this optional KCH21RV handheld control head. The handheld control head has a six foot cord that's terminated in this 20 pin connector. Now, there's a cable that goes between the drawer unit and this 20 pin connector, and it's approximately 18 feet long. The head itself does have a tiny speaker in it, but we're still going to use a larger remoted speaker to take advantage of the available audio of the radio. Now, this control head is comfortable and appears to be of good quality. You can see the button arrangement features a multi-directional switch and it also features a DTMF pad. The advantage of the handheld control head is that it can be set up to have pretty much the same manual of arms as the VP8000 portable radio to assist the end user if that is what they feel. Another is that it allows the operator to more easily change modes and operate the radio by bringing the head into their field of view rather than having to look down. And additionally, allows us to remote that enormous drawer unit and occupies less console space than a conventional remote control head. Let's start our control head conversion of this VM8000. Those of you familiar with Japanese radios will be certainly familiar with the layout of all these connections and things of that nature. So let's go ahead and flip this over. And these tabs right here, we just need to lift these up to the next side. And you'll see there's a seal. And we want to make sure that you don't damage the seal. And as we take this apart, can see that we have this connector here which we we'll use our fingernails here to pull that connector and then we have a ribbon cable here so lift either end of your ribbon cable up and then gently pull in your ribbon cable and it should separate just like that and we'll go ahead and set our old control head aside and then Looking at our other ribbon cable here, or our other connection here. On a ribbon cable connector, when you're working with these, 
take your lock bar and pull your lock bar up ahead of time insert your ribbon cable in and then lower the lock bar down and it'll stop and make sure it's completely seated just like that and then this four pin connector here we will plug in just like that now we can go ahead and hinging on the top here bring this down and it'll snap in place just like that and phase one is complete now we can look at our front connector here and you can see what we need to plug into and that's what we have this for and we can make this cable either dress left or right outside of the transceiver it's up to you I'm gonna go ahead and have it dress right and you can see these small pins on top and these slide into their corresponding slots make sure that's seated and then take your seal place your seal on and once it's seated as such you can kind of feel that purge the air out of it you see we have a cover here and it has an arrow of direction here so what we want to do is is we want these tabs to interface with this so slide this cover on here snap in place and this portion of the conversion is complete do a final inspection of your work and we look good to go now we're going to take and plug our control head cable in and you want to make sure you index this right because it wouldn't take enough it wouldn't take much to damage some of these pins here and you can see that there's a insert right here on the inside and that will correspond with this one here so that gives you a good positive indexing point here insert it together and then turn your lock collar and this is nice and secure and we've applied power and you can see at this time we're transferring firmware to our handheld control head now you can see it says preparing to update control head and now it's going to update firmware again now it's going to reboot, performing its self-test subroutine. And our control head is up and running now. And that's 100% volume there. So if you just had this in a small vehicle and you didn't want to use a speaker, this would probably work out fine for you. Again, I'm going to go ahead and put a remote speaker into it. And then your power on and off switch is right here. So we'll go ahead and power it down. And then we'll reboot. And it should boot up quicker now. Here we go and we're good to go in that regard now let's pin out and install our remote speaker this is the KES 5A speaker which is a 40 watt 4 ohm speaker and these are going to go in pins 4 in or excuse me pins 2 and 6 on this connector here and pin 2 is here And pin six is right here. So after we've installed those pins, let's go ahead and plug it into our connector here. And let's see how loud this thing is. And you can see that's only at half volume. So this is a much louder speaker option. So let's do some basic radio checks. Now I have not aligned this radio and from what I can see the Armada software that I'm using to program the radio lacks the functionality to do so. So this is out of the box. The first test we're going to perform is a reference oscillator which is how close our radio is to being on frequency. 
Typically, you measure and adjust this at the highest frequency that the radio is capable of operating on, and frequency error decreases as frequency decreases. Here are the results of our reference oscillator test, which also gives us our RF power output on 800 megahertz. The radio demonstrates a frequency error of 350 hertz, so it should be aligned before being fielded, especially if it's to be used in the simulcast environment. When we talk about frequency error, we need to consider the specifications of the radio, which is plus minus one part per million, which is 870 hertz at this frequency, and this should be as much as the radio will drift over time. Right now, at plus 350 hertz of error, we are looking at plus four tenths of a part per million, which falls within that specification. The power output at 870 megahertz of 28.1 watts, considering the loss across the six foot test cable and adapter stack is within specification as well. Here are the results of our transmit tests on analog FM, VHF, and UHF. The key takeaways here are that the wideband entitlement as specified works. The fact that one has to request such in a U.S. market commercial radio is absurd. The FM deviation measured at UHF and VHF is a tad under 4.2 kilohertz, which is good. The second is at RF power output, although a tad under spec is also good. And the third takeaway here is that you can see the phenomenon of diminishing frequency error as frequency decreases, with UHF being 170 hertz and then VHF is 20 hertz. Here are the receiver tests on analog FM in a 12 dB Synad test, and the measured performance exceeded specifications. Specified performance on VHF was minus 121.5 decibel milliwatts and measured was minus 123.7 decibel milliwatts. On UHF, specified performance was minus 120.5 decibel milliwatts, and the measured performance was minus 122.4 decibel milliwatts. Fine business. And in our spectral purity check on VHF and on UHF, we can see there are no problems whatsoever. Well, I didn't want to get too deep in the weeds on this radio, so we just did some basic checks. I talked about configuring it for the remote control ahead and showed you the basic operation of the radio. There is an awful lot to go over on this radio, and there are so many different features and options that we're going to be working with here in the near future. So stay tuned for more content on this particular radio. I hope this helps. This is Brett from Survival Comms. Until next time.